Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this, the third um, episode or lecture from this year's Shoot Festival. I'm talking to you from the home of the festival in Shoot, and I'm looking out over the uh, rather wonderful but rather wet uh, meadows of the East Devon area of outstanding natural beauty with some unaccustomed but very welcome rain. Um, I hope the weather is uh, what you're hoping for wherever you are in the world. We have people on the guest list this evening from the US, from India, South Africa, New Zealand, and even some of the further flung parts of the UK itself. Um, may I give a special thanks also on behalf of uh, me and Samantha uh, Knights, the co-director, to all of those of you who have been able to make uh, donations in order to um, help keep the festival free and also to help us make small donations to good causes in the local community here in East Devon, including the local food bank and the local primary school. I'm sure by now that many of you are very used to the new lockdown style of online lectures, so I don't need to tell you where the emergency exits are, but just a small uh, note that um, any time during the um, part of the lecture where James and I are in conversation, please do feel free to write a question in the question and answer box on the tab at the bottom of the screen and we shall endeavour to answer, or James will endeavour to answer, certainly not me, uh, the questions later on. The format of this talk will be, uh, James and I will be in conversation for the first 35 to 40 minutes and then the floor will be opened to all of you in the audience and we shall very much welcome any questions uh, that you have and I'm sure there will be many. So it's a very great pleasure to welcome this evening, uh, James Crowden, who I like to think of as a real modern Renaissance man, a courtier, soldier, scholar, eye, tongue, sword, certainly everything that Hamlet had, James has an even greater abundance. Um, he was an officer of the Royal Engineers, an Oxford educated anthropologist, historian, traveler, sheep shearer, cider maker, historian of cider, uh, his earlier book, Ciderland, uh, was an award-winning book um, going into the history of food in East Devon. He's also a broadcaster um, and a poet. And the thing that brings us here this evening is not just all of this sort of galaxy of past experience that he has, uh, but also to talk about his new book, Frozen River, Seeking Silence in the Himalayas, just published by uh, William Collins, um, which has, uh, again, been published to Brave review. So, um, James, a very warm welcome this evening and uh, thank you for being with us. So, I'm just going to um, start the discussion firstly by um, going into this, uh, this background a bit because the book um, details something that happened a rather long time ago, your, your trip to the Himalayas. It was um, in the 70s, but you started out, as far as I understand, uh, with the prospect of a very secure army career before you. And suddenly you threw it all up and went into the mountains. And can, can you tell us um, what led you to embark on this very extraordinary journey? Well, um, I think there were two things. One was that the army made the terrible mistake of posting me to Cyprus um, twice. I think it was a clerical error. Um, and I used that as a jumping off point for the Middle East. So any leave I had, I grabbed. I'd already been to Turkey in 1968, so when I was 14 I had a great flavour of the classical world and thought, well, I'll leave that till my old age. Um, <laughs> well, not quite, but I thought I was taken with Turkey, particularly eastern Turkey, um, Mount Ararat. I made three or four long forays into, um, into eastern Turkey, each time pushing further east. At the same time, I was always logging in with my great uncle, who was actually lived in Appledore in Kent, and he'd been in India, the family had been there for four or five generations. He was a keeper of the Indian section, the VNA, and he then became the first professor of Indian archaeology at London. And he was um, very gifted at inspiring people. And even though I was about 18, 19, 20, we had long conversations about the geopolitics of the area, um, about India before partition. And also he was very keen on the Buddhist areas. He himself had tried to get to Ladakh in 1942 in a spot of leave up the Sajila, but he was doing it on foot. There was no road and they were turned back by avalanches, which in May is quite common. 
So, and he was desperately keen to get to Alchi, which is a, a famous monastery there, which is um, Professor Snellgrove went and um, actually really um, was the first to investigate it, Snellgrove and Tadeusz Skorupski from SOAS. Um, but my uncle had tipped them off and I thought, well, I better go and see it. And then I also thought, looked at the maps and I realized there was a whole chunk of Ladakh, which nobody really knew much about. And I would have to say that at that point, the war had only stopped in 1971 of the many two or three wars with between Pakistan and India. Very sad, actually. It's a real hangover from the partition and the way in which the, India was divided, for better or worse. Um, but the, the fact of the matter was that the other rest of Ladakh was closed. So you could only really go to the Indus Valley and also to Zanskar. But the Indians had taken the very bold, brave decision to open it up to foreigners. So you, you had this opportunity to travel. We'll look at a map um, in a minute just to help everyone localise uh, where we're talking about. So, but you had the opportunity and presumably the army had toughened you up to a, a certain extent to deal with these sorts of conditions. But before you set off on your journey into the high mountain valleys, did you undertake any other preparations to, to ready yourself for this well, expedition? a bit basic. I've done quite a bit of rock climbing. Um, I've done a bit of snow and ice climbing and sort of learned how to survive in snow holes, which is an army winter mountaineering course. That's always quite good fun. Um, ice climbing is always good. You become acclimatized to the cold and how to survive. I went to see my great uncle, who'd been a mounted policeman in the Yukon in temperatures of like minus 86 in the dog team to join the gold rush. Um, he gave you quite a few tips. I went to a, the Tibetan monastery at Same Ling. Um, I just happened to have a letter of introduction to the Dalai Lama's younger brother, but um, sadly I, I got there a bit late because I was having to come out of the army. My adjutant was very very kind to me. He let me out in about three weeks flat, which is unheard of. As long as I paid some, bought your way out. It's the old way. And you used to have to buy your way into the army in the old days. <laughs> um, but they were very tolerant. And in fact, they, I, I owe the army a lot, actually. So um, after these preparations, let's just, um, I'm going to share the screen because we have some um, slides, um, which are going to be a combination of your photographs and um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, uh, sorry, get the tape from the start. There we are. So hopefully everyone can uh, see these slides. Uh, so you were preparing to um, make the expedition and uh, here is a, a sort of broad map of India. And um, where is Ladakh for the uninitiated, or us uninitiated who've not been there? Well, it looks like it's a bit where E is. Um, as, well, no, 9 and E. It's very con convoluted up there. D, I think, is Kashmir. E, um, the lines of control and the sort of defined and undefined borders. In fact, the Aksai Chin is still being sort of tussled over as we speak. I mean, there's always little flare-ups. So E looks a bit like Ladakh to me. There's the River Indus, which is a wonderful river. Um, there are four rivers that come out of, um, sort of Tibet. And that is one of the main ones, the Lion River. And you can see it snaking. Well, you can't actually, it's the borders. The Durham line, Afghanistan is there. And I spent quite a bit of time in the Hindu Kush. And that was, so I was always moving further east and Ladakh was the next um, place to visit on the edge of Tibet. Right, we can just zoom in. And um, there's a very complex map here, um, which makes it look actually very highly populated this this region that you went to or very very busy certainly can you tell us a, a little bit about where you were going on this map where, where you were well, aiming to get to yeah top left is Cargill um, that's a very important town in the old days in the trade route these are the, the reason Ladakh's important it was slap bang in the middle of the trade route between China and India on the Silk Road there was a everybody thinks the Silk Road was just one route it was many routes and Cargill was known as the town of eight days because it was eight days with your caravan, by caravan, I mean with horses or yak or camels or whatever you had, down to Srinagar to the left. It was eight days to Leh, which is the capital of Ladakh. You can see that right in the middle of the map, just beyond Nimu. It was eight days north up into Skardu, well, that's now in what is, is Pakistan, and eight days down to Padum in Zanskar, which is um, sort of bottom left, below before the go beyond the Drung Drung Glacier and it's where the Zanskar River has two arms. It's not very clear. Stott and Lunak are the two arms. And then the river does an extraordinary thing. It flows north right through a complete mountain range, the Zanskar Range. It's, it's um, not many rivers do that or 
and it was the freezing of that river which attracted me to some extent. Well, let's, um, we, we have a number of your uh, images taken from your journey and I'm just going to move on to one of these because of course that map doesn't really give you a sense of the grandeur or scale or the majesty or, or the isolation um, of, of the region. Um, I mean, you, you talked about how it was generally closed um, and which travellers, I mean, can you tell us about any of the travellers who had been there before you and I mean, what they've managed to bring back about the region, uh, just to give a sense of how, um, in a sense, pioneering your own journey was? Well, the extraordinary thing, indeed, the, the, the curious thing is that the first visitor to Zanskar was one of the earliest and one of the most curious. He was called Choma de Korosh. Uh, he was a Hungarian linguist. He walked all the way from Hungary to um, Zanskar, something I must admit I had not done. And he was tipped off. Those of you who know your um, Afghan history, there were two, two gentlemen, Moorcroft and Trebek, and they were in Ladakh at the time, and they realised he was such a good linguist. He'd gone out there to try and find the roots of the Hungarian language. They said, no, 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 it's much more interesting that you learn Tibetan. And they arranged for a stipend from the East India Company. And then he went into Zanskar in the 1820s. And he was there twice. And he spent a winter there in Puktal Monastery, working under a monk called Sange Ponsok. And nobody, no Westerner, as far as we knew, as far as I know, had spent a winter there. And nobody knew very much about Zanskar at all. There have been others. I just moved on to the yeah. next slide because again uh, this gives you, um, I mean this looks like more of a summer slide but it gives you um, an impression of the challenge of travelling into this uh, region even in the better times. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about well, what we've seen here? And what two or three things. The, yeah absolutely. This is the Zojila, Zuji, as they call it. Um, and the, the road is the military road, which was pushed through by the Indian Army. I mean, as an army engineer, I have great respect for them because the road is always moving. And this was taken as I went in, in November um, 1976. And you can just see the, um, the telegraph poles. That was the only telephone communication into Ladakh, um, certainly not in Zanskar. And down below is a very interesting, that line that traces down to the bottom left is the old caravan route. And this is just before the snow comes and all those nullas, those water courses, those steep, they are terrifying for avalanches because the powder snow avalanches just come down all the time. That's one reason why my great uncle couldn't get up there. And also often even military convoys get caught in avalanches um, because this pass is closed for six months of the year from November right through till May. From what you say, there's a great sense of history about the region. I mean, the draw of its isolation. Um, is there anything else which particularly drew you to that place at that time? Um, I think it was several things. One was the um, it was the the nature of Buddhism. Tibet was closed. Um, there was very even Sikkim, Bhutan, you couldn't get to, or unless you were a doctor or on a special. There were very few traditional Tibetan Buddhist areas you could get to. Most of Nifa was closed, Arunachal Pradesh probably didn't exist then, Taiwan. And so it was just extraordinary when it did open up. And I realised that um, I went with a young lady called Fiona Lumsden, and her father had been to Tibet in the 1930s with a plant hunting expedition. And her very good friend, her father, um, Peter Haley, who'd been a bursar of um, St Anthony's College in Oxford had been the district commissioner in Ladakh in 1939 and I got a feel for the place from them and I also got a feel from a wonderful mountaineer called Eric Shipton and I met him several times uh, in once in the Royal Geographical Society in the famous map room we got the maps out he looked at the maps and I showed him Zanskar and he just went silent he said we had no idea it was there I mean, the idea of um, the draw of Buddhism, I mean, it, it clearly suggests that, that um, I mean, there are many things, um, some, I mean, very profound and spiritual, but also the, I mean, the challenge of reaching this area, which was closed. I mean, it gives us a lot to, to talk about. And what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about, or, or get, we'll ask you to talk about some of the practicalities of your journey to start out with, uh, how you got there 
and what you found. And then I'm going to move on to talk about some um, grander questions um, about the ideas that uh, you found uh, that, that were raised by your journey. Um, so let's, uh, let's get down to the um, nitty gritty of travel and, and your exploration. Can you tell us about your journey there? And I, I've just put up one of the um, slides from earlier on in your journey. This is um, the village of Panikar, which is now much larger, shall we say. This gives you, this is some of the valley, the that particular valley, the Suru Valley is Muslim, um, up to Panikar, they are Shia, but here they are Sunni in this village. Um, and it's an important little village because it was the roadhead for many years. And as an engineer, or as a civil engineer, um, having just got a degree, which was a miracle in itself, um, I was fascinated by the interaction between the roads and studying a valley. So that half of the reason for going was to study the effect, the long-term effect of a road going into a remote area. So you can see here, these are fairly basic houses, stone, mud brick, hay on top, animals, that's it. Um, the snow came down about a week later. So ju just to make clear, you couldn't just jump in a Land Rover and drive to, um drive beyond it this is this is where no, this was, I mean, as i said with cargill it was eight days so the first bit the first you lose a day you do it in, bad, in the back of a truck um but it was like minus 10 here at night often they're just um getting the goats sheep and goats backwards and forwards this is below a wonderful mountain called nun kun and there's a threshing circle in the foreground so the goats are gleaning um, and there's a great sense of just waiting for the winter for the snows to come and there's a sense of having worked all of them very hard in the summer just to get enough fodder in to keep the animals alive over the winter. So you're, you're about to travel on the, on the threshold of winter. Indeed. Isn't that what we're seeing in these pictures. Um, and... Yes, this was, they, they have little runtucks, which are their little water mills in that um, stone, very low stone structure at the end of the leet, as we call it on the Ledger Dartmoor, is going in. And then they have to grind all the corn they can, mostly barley and a bit of wheat. They can just grow. I've seen wheat growing up to 12,000 feet, which is remarkable in itself, and barley up to 14,000. So that little lead is about to freeze over. So they only have a month or month and a half after harvest in which to get all the corn ground. Otherwise, you're back to querns again. So life is pretty basic. So even here, you're all, even though you're at the roadhead, you're still on the verge of a subsistence economy. Oh, without doubt. And the road brought some prosperity. I was also fascinated by so many things. I mean, I was fascinated by how a river freezes up. It's not so an you, easy, it's a long process. So you, you get to, and then this is your path, your, your road, is that right? Yeah, um, I wasn't on the ice at that point, but it took two days. None of the men wanted to go. They said it was too old, it was too cold, um, there were all sorts of reasons, their horses were knackered. So all the extra, there had been a very bad winter in Zanskar in 1956, when nearly all the animals died, certainly all the horses died, and the government decided that they would then have an emergency ration station there. And so every year they would take um, a lot of horses, like I've been with caravans, the first time I went in in the summer of 1976, um, we tagged on the end of a salt caravan of about 80 to 100 horses. There's a so, wonderful um, rhythm with being on a caravan like that. So when you travelled up, you actually travelled in the manner of a caravan with horses, and that's what drew you, that's how you went along these... Yes, I had to have like four horses. This is my own little caravan of four horses. You're sort of judged by the number of horses in your caravan. Being four, I wasn't really, you know, you were sort of scraping the bottom a bit. What, what were your um, horses loaded up with in this? Well, I took a lot of food in. Um, I think at least one, a lot, of, a lot of things, equipment, skis, snowshoes. I had no idea what the winter was going to be like. So the main question to answer for me was, how on earth do they survive the winter? Because nobody really knew. Um, it, it was interesting. Food. This is the back end of Kun. Um, Nung Kun is a wonderful massif. Um, it's a complete... Um, it's a very large area. It's the biggest peak in the area um, in Himalayan terms. It's not vast, it's only 23 and a half thousand feet, but it certainly stands head and shoulders above other peaks in the area. Um, in Pakistan, there'd be Nanga Parbat, and um, when I was climbing up some of the other mountains, we could see K2, which was uh, only 150 miles to the north. 
and there's a stone structure in the foreground of this. Is, is that for the use of travellers in some way? Yes, it'd be like an ILAC or a summer camp. Um, and these the, often, they're very much transhumans in the sense that the animals will go out of the village for four or five months of the summer. And then they'll set up summer camps, usually with yak hair tents, making butter, which is then traded down the river in, in the winter. Um, so there are these little, sometimes you get the odd little abandoned village because they are absolutely on the front line of agriculture. And I think that is one of the main things I've brought back with me was a, a deep respect and interest in just the nuts and bolts of how you survive with agriculture, because it's such an important part of our own survival now. And we sort of, if you tinker with it too much, you um, leave yourself wide open. Your initial um, destination after you travelled um, up the valley was uh, the village of Padum. Um, how, how was, uh, how, how did you find the village and, and what was your manner of living when you uh, arrived there? Well the village was fine, um, my manner of living was very basic. This is um, a Buddhist house in, in um, just on the way near Randol and you can see immediately it's much bigger, it's much more together and these are yak herders and they're making a lot more money um, not just because they sell so much more butter, they, but they also sell a lot of horses and horses were used a lot on the, the, the Karakoram trade route and the Indian army, which um, actually has been in occupation in Ladakh ever since partition, um, often the horses, that's the only way they can actually resupply some of their very remote units, say up on the Siachen Glacier. So these people will make um, quite good money. And, I mean, you talk about this being a Buddhist house, and of course, as you said, you're moving into um, a Buddhist area. How conscious were you of the change in religion um, and culture as you moved up the valley towards the village and, and drew into the area? It, it, it's very marked. Um, also, there's a lot the population, because the Buddhists have practiced polyandry for maybe hundreds, hundreds of years, they keep their population down to the land that they have. And so, although there are less, um, less densely populated than, say, the Suru Valley, um, they, uh, they manage to live, shall we say, more economically off the land that they have. And some of them will get jobs outside. It's, the road has changed that. Um, but yes, there was a very marked change in atmosphere and also in the visible signs, um, mantras, chortans. Um, it's a whole very different belief system. And again, I mean, this is part of, um, these are the fields outside the village. Well, this is just a, a lake that's dried up and this is, in the distance is Randon Monastery, um, which is uh, very, it's a Gelugpa monastery and it's quite remote there. It's very prone to very strong winds and about two hours later, I was having, we were having to walk into a, like a 30 mile gale. It was um, very difficult. We had dust storms. Um, this is ice actually that's on the ground here, so it's just frozen. And in the summer, it's a wonderful um, sanctuary for wildfowl. This is a very um, insightful picture. This is how life was in the, one of the main houses in, in Padum. Um, Padum had been, they had a king of Padum. The palace, it's a complex political sort of structure. They'd lost their king. They'd been invaded by the Dogras in about 1830s and the palace had been torn down. And the man on the right is my very good friend, Ponsok Dawa, who ended up being my interpreter. And he was the king of Padum's son, and he is now the king of Padum. But you can see life is pretty basic. In the barrel is Chang, which is their beer they make from barley, and little dobs of butter on the side. Their lighting is fairly basic. That's one cracked sort of lantern. And often it's with little um, either kerosene or even mustard oil lamps. And the pride and joy was the pressure cooker, uh, which makes cooking easier at high altitude. And on the left is Ponsok Dawa's mother, who on the far left, and she had um, a, her brother was quite a famous meditator. And they're often, they're sort of, they lead this very complex life, um, which is sort of half, um, they're sort of half, almost sort of academic Buddhism, they're very, and then half agriculture, it's a wonderful mixture. Uh, one day they'll be involved with very, very important complex pujas, and the next day they'll be out ploughing. 
Well, that um, con contrast between the academic Buddhism and the, the harshness of life is something to um, something very much to um, e explore. I'm just mm -hmm. going to pass on. Um, can you tell us more about your um, daily living and, and in, in what manner you lived there and where, where you actually stayed? Well, this is um, this is actually from my front door. I had a hut very similar to that one, mud brick, and it's like if it was minus 20 outside it'd be minus 10 inside and if it was minus 30 outside it'd be at least minus 15 inside i had a, a little stove but very little fuel because i got there so late so i would have a, an hour's cooking from every other day so it was pretty basic the room was about 15 14 and a half feet by about nine feet um which was fine i didn't, wouldn't have wanted it any larger but it was a summer room um not used in winter so i had to block up the drafts and Life was just basic, but why not? Um, it gives you plenty of time to think about the direction of your life and the people you're living amongst. I mean, there, there may be people who live in sort of drafty old houses who conceive of being cold, but I mean, was it, how was it really the case that you could live in such sort of cold and sparse conditions and yet, um, I mean, contemplate um, life in the way that you did. I mean, doesn't the cold in these sorts of circumstances just draw you into yourself and focus on survival and the cold? I had quite good clothing. I had a good sleeping bag. Um, I had the best mountain equipment um, that I could. I had, I had quite a lot of mountaineering equipment with me. I had an ice axe, crampons. I was all ready for anything. I did quite a bit of climbing in the next summer um, if other people turned up. I think that you in this this is daytime this is the sunrise at about nine o'clock so when it could be like you have this strange thing if it's it could be like quite warm in the summer's day like a summer's day 20 say and then as soon as the sun goes down the temperatures drop um within 20 minutes or within 40 minutes you're down to minus 20 so you're dropping about one degree centigrade a minute and then you are cold and you learn to live with cold you learn to move snow is another problem if the snow builds up, the roofs collapse. So they have to, um, they have a very clever little trick. They, once the snow is falling, they'll have a little broom and then they'll pile it up into a pile, leave it for a few hours. There is something called the metamorphosis of snow, which is very applicable to avalanches and mountains. And then when it becomes like what I call snowball snow, you can make snowballs out of, they then chuck it over onto the ground below. Um, and <coughs> Yeah, this is your like your two CV. This is your Land Rover. This is how you get around. This, and um, everything the man is wearing is made within the valley. Possibly his cap comforters come from the Indian Army, but everything, the cloaks, everything are woven out of the wool. The the wrap. The um, he's got those wonderful boots. He's got like little moccasins. They've got leather soles on the bottom. Um, they're very very self-contained and they do move around while until the snow becomes really deep they will move around quite a bit between villages in the winter he has i mean just a, a wonderful smile despite the i mean what one would conventionally think of as being a very harsh life how, how did you find um the villagers personally do they welcome you um oh. were you able to integrate into the life of the village easily yes they were very welcoming um they have a great sense of travelers hospitality and they're quite willing to share food and drink because they will often be traveling themselves. And often some of them were very well traveled. Um, there was one man, I think we'll see his picture in a minute. He walked to Lhasa and back, here we are. The man in the background, the girl in the front um, was my friend's sister. She's eating Sampa, which is the main diet. You can see from her cloak that um, they make use of every scrap of clothing in the winter. The man in the background um, is my friend's grandfather had walked two if not three times to Lhasa and back which is a journey um, of at least three months um, and he was taking yak there and he was then buying the kangyu the scriptures and also part of the lokchak which was a sort of tribute it's a bit complicated the relationship between Ladakh and Tibet but at one time Ladakh was the um, took up most of western Tibet as well um, but they this is going down the river, just about to take off. I was just going to say, so uh, one of your, um, one, one of the main features of your um, time there was joining one of these long 
journeys um, again to sell butter, but not, I mean, not towards Tibet, but back, uh, back down towards the capital. Um, so, I mean, tell us about this, this journey where I think you really did encounter the ice on the river. Yes, it was um, about 100 miles. Not all of it, about 70 miles was actually on the ice. Um, we were sleeping in caves. I took no tent, no stoves, nothing. Just, I knew Wilfred Thesiger quite well, and he said, just don't bother with any of those things. I'm like, <laughs> it worked. Um, this is crossing the river. I had to do that 30 times like that. And the first lesson I learned was that rivers don't always freeze over, and sometimes they are incredibly dangerous. I mean, the Dakis, of course, thought nothing of this. They just ran around and then eventually put their trousers back on. Uh, uh, I mean, how on earth is it good to cross a freezing river with no trousers or shoes on? I mean, why well, is, that, <laughs> is, the, there, is there no well, better way? Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the sort of law of um, Arctic travel, is that if you get your boots wet or you get your clothes wet, you've had it. Because they, they then freeze stiff as a board. If you can't get your boots on, you'll then get frostbite. So whenever you had a, um, a place like this or anywhere where there was um, running water, you, it was much better to take your, keep your powder dry, but keep your socks dry as well. And it um, was cold. Uh, it is, it's about, probably about minus 35 here. Um, I did some trial runs in the valley first where I slept out and they thought I was mad, but I slept out in the snow, made little snow caves and um, just to test myself and my equipment. Um, they are, this is George Sering on the left, I can recognise him, and um, that'll be my next door neighbour, Tashi Tantar on the right, and they've got big packs, um, and they got a, they're very strong, they'll be taking 5, 10, 15, maybe 20 kilos of butter down to lay to trade, and they get a good price for it. And this butter is superior butter? Oh, without a doubt, yes, it's none of your government ammo butter, they could sell it for Amal butter would be about 30 rupees a kilo, they could get 45 rupees. And it was very much sought after by the Ladakis and the old trading families. And there are lots of wonderful trading families in Leh, some from Kashgar and Yarkand as well. And they will take these extraordinary risks that we can see in these pictures, and th th this incredibly dangerous journey just to sell that butter in the, in the capital. Well, they regarded it as a holiday. I mean, they, their winter's long, it's a bit boring sitting at home, so it's a bit, definitely a boy's outing. Uh, well, we, we, we can see some of them here. Is, is this the way to a cave where you see? Um, well, it looks like it, but in fact, um, I mentioned avalanches. I could may talk a bit more about avalanches later, but because it's in the gorge, the aval is very avalanche prone, and often you get avalanche cones and you have to walk around them. Um, sometimes villages disappear, and I've got many instances of um, either groups, sometimes of men, sometimes of women, who have died in avalanches. Um, you can't predict them. This is a wonderful section right in the middle and for any geologist it's a, it's a godsend because you can see the whole structure um, of the, this is there's the Himalayan range, the Zanskar range, the Dak range and then the Karakoram. So this is right in the middle of the Zanskar range. And you were just proceeding up in very cold conditions. Yes, it was, you have to keep, um, I wore Dakstein mitts, so those grey mitts and they're wonderful but you've just got to keep your, um, keep your hands and your nose and your ears free from um, freezing up. And sometimes the path did disappear and we ended up climbing along the top walls there, sometimes be 50, 60 feet up. Um, I had, re in fact, I wasn't wearing my mountaineering boots because they're, they're a bit too stiff. I was wearing Norwegian cross-country ski shoes that somebody lent me from Bristol, Stephen McFarlane. There we are, I'm wearing them there. This is Ley, this is the hot spot of Ley. And this, this was your um, destination on this, this journey? Yeah, we spent three or four days there, got rather bored. I mean, you know, sort of, it was rather... And you shaved. <laughs> and that's the palace, the king's or queen's palace in, in Ley behind, which has now been restored and is open. It's well worth a visit. This is on the old, the new polo pitch. Prior to that, they played polo up and down the main street, and just boarded up the shops. But, but you did sort of things that are, oh, yes, there was a problem going back. It had been such nice weather, we thought, we, we knew it was too good to be true, and it was. Um, the river level had risen by at least six inches or a foot, sometimes 18 inches. There had been a four in the side valley, the Marker Valley, and it was hairy going back. I mean, the ice could break at any moment, and once you're in the water, there was no chance of saving you. Um, this is an interesting little photograph. 
Um, the water, the river is flowing underneath and then there's the, the river's collapsed. You can see how the main bed of the ice has collapsed and then the water's flowing on top. So this illustrates the point I was sort of making that you carry your um, boots with you and that's the size of their packs and the man in front's carrying a stove, that's Dorje Sering. He had a wonderful memory and he could remember thousands of verses of um, one of the main, the Gesa epics. And that's uh, Tashi Tanta. Um, and we stepped in caves, which was pretty primitive. We saw tracks of snow leopard once or twice. Um, and they slept under their cloaks. They, that was it. They just slept in a long line. And you get enough firewood from just picking up odd twigs that are trapped under boulders. And that's how you, you, you get your fire. Just luckily we had a little bit in the morning there, but sometimes there wasn't enough firewood and you just got up and went until you could stop. So this was one aspect of your journey. I mean, the, I mean, the sheer simplicity of the travel, um, going with people on these journeys. But I mean, another main part was the encounter with um, Buddhism that many people wouldn't have seen in its day-to-day -day practice. Um, and we'll just see some of the pictures and um, ask you to talk about the way that some of the customs were um, were observed in the valley. I mean, I think one of the first things, and we saw a picture earlier in the distance of a, of a monastery. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us about, uh, I think this is one of the monks. Oh, he was a, he was a, um, a well-known meditator. He also liked his Chang, the beer. Um, he was called Gombo. He was a fascinating man. Um, he had trained down in Lahu. He's a Kagyu, um, they're a Kagyu Drukpa, they're the lion, dragon sect. And in fact, they have links with Bhutan. And occasionally I saw Bhutanese monks coming across. There's so basically the yellow hats and the red hats and the Gelukpa, the yellow hats are um, sort of really part, the Dalai Lama is part of that main group. They're like the reformed. This is um, Sonamanchuk on the left, wonderful man. He's still alive. I saw him two years ago with his father. He's an Amchi, which means a Tibetan herbal doctor. He's a historian, a teacher of Tibetan. He's an astrologer. He was also the Earl of Kasha and a very, um, very noble man. And it was his great mother's great uncle who taught, um, taught Choma de Korosh uh, when he came to the valley in the 19, 1820s. And they still remember it as if it was yesterday. And I think this is one of the, um, one of the monasteries. Yes, this is Puktal, where Choma de Korosh stayed. Um, I've been there quite a few times now. It's the most extraordinary monastery. Um, in fact, all of them are extraordinary. This is Nawak Tarpa, who was a monk who left his village for, for 25 years, was in Lhasa, and pretty well came out top of his, of his whole area. He was debating with the main monks of Drepung and Ganden, and was a geisha, which is a, like a philosophy, doctor of philosophy, and was supervising the, the wonderful debates that they have, the sort of dynamic debates in Buddhism. And so uh, it's a very, I mean, it's not just a religion of contemplation, it's also a religion where you have text. You mentioned the oh. trade of butter for texts, and I think we can see one here. Yes, the, the handmade paper will be made in the valley, the ink will be made in the valley, um, they even got the wooden blocks so they can make their own, not the main ones, they go to Lhasa, the big printing houses in Lhasa below the Patala. Um, but they have a lot of their excess money would go into either supplying text or if one of the family becomes a monk or a nun um, and there are quite a few nuns in Zanskar and that was very good. You were also privileged to see a number of um, festivals take place and we have a few photographs. Um, yeah this was in Kasha Monastery, Kasha Kustor. This was in February, no, just in January, very end of January um, and this is a parak which is what the women wear, it's part of their diary and they always have a goat skin on the back and there are lots of usually turquoise or lapis on the back. Um, and they were wearing them in the fields. This is Hu Shang, who is sort of representing Chinese Chan Buddhism. He sits there and welcomes people. So you have a mixture of uh, traditions that end up, I mean, Chinese. Yes, that is, everything is very layered. And so Hu Shang was actually symbolizing a, a, a particular debate in 830, I think, or whatever, um, with Kamala Sila. Um, the sort of monastic and then this is a this is later in the year this is actually a two-day fast um, and they're raising up these tankas and a lot of the women um, it's called Nyungnis and a lot of the women um, will go and they will be fasting and meditating and having visualizations it's extraordinary and I mean, also, I'm just very privileged to see yeah. 
uh, I mean, these very ancient uh, frescoes in one of the, the monasteries. Yes, this was, um, absolutely. This was in complete darkness and I had no idea what I was photographing. I heard about this was in Kasha. They were the work of a particular painter called Jed Badoje, I think, um, 1300, um, about then. There was an earlier painter called Rinchen Zangpo who'd been done the paintings in um, Alchi and he had one or two things in Ladakh. They're very fine, but structurally they were starting to wear out. They've been restored. I'm not quite sure if they've been well restored, but they certainly have been restored and you can now have light in there so you can see them now. This is the and, wood. I mean, they're, they're remarkably <clears throat> similar to some of the festivals that, that you see. There's an extraordinary sense of continuity in some of these pictures over a very yes. long period of time. Yes, absolutely. I mean, this, you could be back in Buddha's time, which is the idea. Um, you've got the robe, you've got the begging bowl. Um, there, are, there are all sorts of interpretations. It would, I've not seen you know, much written about these paintings. I would like to. I'm just uh, this is my favourite. That was my favourite. If you just go back one. Um, that is, uh, you see, look, it's very rare to get the perspective on those two faces on either side. Um, and this is sort of about, written, painted about the same time as Giotto was active, if not a bit earlier. Um, that's very fine work. I'm just going to start to draw together the um, strands of this first half of the discussion before we move to questions and answers with two uh, grander questions. Um, your book concludes with a return journey which, which, where you're going by cross-country skis and probably the first time that cross-country skis were used um, in the region and you ended up um, I mean, coming very close to death, but undergoing a, an experience which was quite like a, an epiphany, which, I mean, it seems to me has a great connection with a lot of your later life's journey and your, your life's work. And how, how did you find that um, epiphany? Can you tell us a little bit about that return journey? Because yes, I've never really thought it was an epiphany, but it was certainly one's glad to be alive. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to ski out of the valley to re reconstruct the journey I did in with the four horses. I would then ski back out, which I did. Um, but the snow was, snow came, uh, first of all, I thought there wasn't enough snow. Then the monks had a special puja in Kasha, not for me, but for them, because they rely entirely on the snow in the glaciers. This is a mountain, by the way, called Mir Samir, and I got very near to the top of it um, in the summer, so I got very fond of that picture. And it was about a week's journey of skiing, and I got held up for two days in a particular village, and wolves came down and took, took the um, sheep and goats. This was back at Rangdon, and this was just on May Day, or just, this was actually May the 2nd, and the avalanches were coming down thick and fast, and I had this extraordinary choice of either um, skiing under avalanches or going onto a frozen river that was breaking up. And then there were winds. It was, you know, you do those things when you're that age. But you, you, you survived. And I mean, there was a great sense of, um, I mean, the joy in the most simple things. Oh, yeah. Um, the importance of just having a glass of tea, having, a, ha having the beer. Absolutely. Having the they, food. Mm. And the, 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 that seems to sort of dictate um, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the particular family, I went back there um, two or three years ago in, in the village of Tashi Tanze, and um, they had sort of taken me in and sort of um, looked after me for a day, and then I went on, but I, I was very grateful to them, and um, they, they have time to contemplate in the winter. They, um, they will often meditate themselves, even the farmers will. I'm just going to bring the screen share to an end here, because I um, very much like to give time to uh, questions um, questions which are coming in. We already have a number in uh, the box and others which have been sent in. I'm just going to start with um, one from uh, Jake who, who asks, um, I mean you had this journey in 1976 and you, you've only just written it up. Um, why the long wait? Well, very good question. Um, by being grieved? Well, I was, I came back and I suddenly, I'd, I'd applied to go to Oxford to do anthropology and amazed, much about amazement, I was, I was accepted. So I had to dive straight into academia. Um, and I was suffering a bit from culture shock. I came into this small little cottage in Oddington outside on Otmore. And I remember very clearly, I'd forgotten about what electric kettles were. So I put the electric kettle on the gas stove and wonder what the burning rubber was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you very quickly lose your, the culture shock is actually coming back. Not, um, not going out there. You think it's going out there, but it isn't. And uh, academia, I, I loved it at the Pitt Rivers Museum, but I wanted to write the book. So I, 
I wasn't there wasn't the funding actually that's, that's also another another problem um, so I then led a rather strange life peripatetic life of being a sort of sheep shearer I went up to the Outer Hebrides Bristol docks and ended up in Dorset and I was scribbling down things that I remembered and I did write a lot when I was in Shaftesbury and then some other bits and pieces so I had a basic diary I had three or four notebooks but they tragically got burnt in a fire in Sands in Shaftesbury so my academic career slightly went up the spout then, but I still kept in touch with my tutor there, lovely man, he's still around now, aged about 19 in Kansas. But um, So I still kept in touch, but I wasn't quite sure whether I'd write it up as you would a PhD or whether, and then I did try, I wanted to do little nibbles with publishers, but I didn't really have the time or, or the money perhaps to spend a year or two and to really contemplate what it had done. And I think I also had to absorb the journey and learn a lot more about Buddhism and Ladakh, and I wanted to write something that was basically good anthropology, but also good literature, and that's taken a while to manage. So, um, it, in geological terms, it's not a not a very long time. Well, uh, that's a nice follow-on to another question. Um, I mean, Hugh Sinclair has both asked about the um, the way to write the book, but also he says, "Can't resist to follow up as a geologist." Did you realise you were crossing the geological suture between the Indian and Asian plates as you travelled down the gorge? Oh, Some yes. Some chilling is the remnants of the Tethys Ocean. Yes, so the, the Tethys Ocean. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, no, I was aware of the Tethys Ocean. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. The, the mountains are young. They're, well, they're, they're, they're young in the sense that they're, they're still moving up. Um, and Chilling is an interesting place. A lot of um, coppersmiths there. So it is geologically, it was interesting, but there was a lot of snow around, so you couldn't, sometimes you could observe it, but um, it is fascinating because geologists don't often have that luxury of having, apart from where there's irrigation and villages, having the, the rocks bare, and they're very beautiful. There's a wonderful spread of uh, questions coming of all sorts. Um, please, please do keep them coming. Um, I'm just going to try to cover as many as I, as I can. Um, Another specific question is uh, from Valerie Ingram. In terms of clothing, a deep red colouring is evidence. What is the source of this dye? Well, there was a, um, there was a wonderful man who used to come up from Lahul every summer to Ladakh. Um, it's almost a magenta colour. And he was, he was known as the tent waller because he had an old parachute, which was his tent. And he'd been a monk in Likir Monastery and he'd been thrown out for having an affair with a young lady. Um, so he then became the tent waller and he brought all sorts of wonderful things up every summer and just camped there. That's where they would get the dye from um, and it would be from the bazaars of Manali probably. Um, I think they may have used madder if you're talking about the, the it's not dissimilar to madder. Um, they're also aware I found while rhubarb, the herbal doctor Sonamanchuk, he was very knowledgeable on a lot of the, um, the herbs and the problem with, shall we say, the Chinese being in Tibet was they don't have access to um, a lot of the herbs they used to be able to get from, say, Eastern Tibet, although there is quite a good Tibetan medicine, Amchi's school in, in, um, in Dharamsala at the moment at McLeod Ganj. So they can train and they will often, a particular, even on the, on the, on the Zojila, there was a particular root called um, Kat, which they would gather and that would be used as a dye, but also as a slight intoxicant. Um, that caused a few problems, shall we say. Well, apart passing from uh, intoxication to marriage, um, there's uh, another very good anthropological question, this time from Tasha Khan, uh, Tasha Khan Davis. Oh, yeah. um, in what way did polyandry lead to a sustainable way of living? Well, it, polyandry is, is unusual um, in the sense that um, you, um, one, one woman might have two husbands. Often it's fraternal polyandry. It's quite common in Tibet, and I think it was adopted even by the royal families way back. It was a way of um, conserving your fields where the basic agricultural land is scarce. Then often one brother would be away either fighting or he would be, um, sometimes you might get four brothers. One would be a monk, one would be, two, two would be married to the same, another one might go off and live somewhere else. And obviously with only, um, it keeps the population down. You work out your biological, the mathematics, um, whereas every, every system seemed to work well in Ladakh. Um, there was monogamy, there was monks, nuns, um, not all of them, even at Hanle, there were supposed to be some married monks and nuns. And one or two, one man I knew, he had two wives, one for, he said one for inside and one for outside, in a sense. They shared the work and they really liked it. And often the second wife would be chosen by the first wife, usually a sister or a, a cousin. 
in many ways it seems a remarkably progressive society. I mean, recycling, no waste. Um, they were way ahead of us then. <laughs> yes, yes, quite. I mean, it looks like there is a lot for them to uh, to teach us. Um, I'm, I'm moving over to um, a different type of question from um, Max Mackay James, who's already Hi. had a chance to read um, your books, um, or th this book. Mm -hmm. And a very good question. Can you talk about the um, language you write the book with? Um, short, sharp, two-word sentences and so on. I mean, it's a, uh, I mean, many people have commented on the, the beauty of the language. Um, I mean, on the one hand, it can be very um, spare, but on the other hand, I mean, reflect the beauty of, of the place and contemplation. I think it was um, two things. One was, curiously enough, being in the army, you have a completely different language in the army and you have to be short, sharp, and um, otherwise you're misunderstood. And that can lead to, um, lead to sort of strange situations where it sort of like, you know, depends which cannons you're charging towards. But no, I think it was to do almost an expression of the landscape. Um, it's also, it's on the verge, it's between poetry and prose. And I think I could have turned it into a great sort of heavy prose book in the sense, but I was always on that boundary, like on the ice, you're on the boundary between what's solid and what isn't. And um, it was really what is in your mind just before you construct a long sentence. Well, there's a very nice question from Elaine Hay that um, picks up on, on mm -hmm. that in a way. It says, it is a very poetic book. And um, she mentions Wordsworth famously talking of emotion recollected in tranquility. Is this true of your experience or is it the other way around? Tranquility recollected with emotion? Both, I would have said. Um, I think it was a lot of the, I was amazed when I went back to my diaries. I almost lost them. They were shoved away in, um, in a, actually they lived in my little outhouse for many years where I stored the apples. And I looked back at them and although I was, you know, they, I didn't think much of it at the time, I was actually writing down furiously everything I could remember and it was just coming back, it wasn't structured, because I'd lost the notebooks, I wasn't in a kind of academic frame of mind, so I just sort of let rip, and um, often those shorter sentences are how you experience things in reality, particularly in mountaineering or dangerous situations. Um, you're absorbing, you haven't, it's almost to do with linguistics, you haven't got the sentence, we don't have sentences in our head, we construct them with our lips, but actually it's just that fraction of a second before them when you have, um, you're just observing what's, so it's flowing through you as it were. I mean, on, on this point of language, Mike from Sussex asks, I mean, you, you make light of, or fairly light of the language barriers that you face, but I mean, given that you were so isolated, um, didn't you find the challenge of language and communication difficult, at least in the beginning? It, it was a bit, I mean, the concept hour spoke quite good English. It was one of the very few, there were two men there in that village who spoke English, um, which helped. At the same time, I just finished three years of doing a degree and actually I didn't want to be too academic. <laughs> but at the same time, I wanted, I had a good camera and I was observing everything from dawn till dusk in the village. I mean, it was almost like not quite mass observation, but um, I think with language you pick up, the problem was there were no books on the language. There were classical Tibetan texts from about the 1870s. In fact, one by Yashka, who was fed over from the, um, from the work by... Um, uh, Joma de Korosh. So classical Tibetan, it's rather like taking, well, like you'd appreciate this, taking your classical um, Latin texts to go and study with a, um, a group of peasants in the, in the sort of in the Italian high Alps, you see. Um, it wasn't, it was useful if you were studying the Tibetan texts, but the, it's surprising, I spoke a bit of Urdu because I'd been in, in Iran and Farsi and a bit of Dari, so enough, I could do basic communication about agriculture. Um, it's like how many yaks do you have or um, these were quite and I got quite a lot of information that way which was then taken over by um, a very good tutor at um, Bristol University, Henry Osmiston. There, there are two well, not quite yak questions but certainly nutrition questions which I, I'll um, put to you together, one from Ned Reiser, one from Gabriele Reifenberg. Oh yeah. Um, Ned asks about where do the herbalists actually gather their medicinal plants, were they cultivated or well crafted or traded? And was going, so just a, a, another question from Gabriele. Can you tell us about more about the food and how it helps um, their good health despite the harsh conditions? And has that diet changed since the um, road came through? Are they now sort of chowing down on McDonald's like everyone else? Uh, sadly, no McDonald's there, so bloody good job. <laughs> um, 
Although I'm sure yak would yak would make a very good McDonald's. I wouldn't, you know, <laughs> yak meat. In fact, I had some very good ibex meat out there. I mean, the Buddhists pretend they don't shoot anything, but they do. If they've been in the Ladakh, Ladakh scouts, it's amazing what comes out of the woodwork. Um, just for Ned's question, the herbalists like um, Sonamanchuk would go into the hills for two or three two or three days. He would know where to collect things. He'd learnt them from his father, I think, and that knowledge is passed on. Um, and these are the dried, I've been to his house, they've got a whole room full of dried herbs and sometimes they're crushed. It's in the, the normal Tibetan tradition of herbal medicine, which is often they will, um, I had an interesting encounter in Bristol with a Tibetan, a Ladakhi trained in Tibetan medicine many years ago. I, for instance, I just said to him, how come there's so much mental illness in the West? And he looked at me and thought for about two minutes or looked around and he said, too much choice. Um, <laughs> that we are so lucky we don't realize. It, it takes me to one other question. I'll just try to wrap up with a couple more well, questions. Answer, so many that could be asked. But, um, a shorter one than a longer one. Uh, from Manisha Ahmed. Um, I mean, what have been the main agents of change in the area? I mean, I think you've been able to visit uh, certainly since 1976. And can you tell us briefly about the, the changes of which there must be many? Absolutely. I'll just finish Gabriella's answering her question on. Sampa was the main thing, and I loved it. Tibetan Eric Shipton reckoned that Sampa was the sort of, you know, the, You've never felt better on it traveling and going on to the early Everest expeditions with a bit of peas in. Um, and not many, they've improved with more vegetables now, um, more rice. I think a lot of them were eating, they, they're slightly abandoning their agriculture, which is one also answering the question from Manisha. I think this is one of the problems is that they've now got jobs, government jobs, which is good. A lot of the women have got jobs, that's fantastic. Um, they're much more aware of politics. But the, um, the problem is, I think they are. They're not valuing their own agriculture. It's, it's something which um, several of my friends have tried to, is to do with the irrigation. And as to the changes, the problem is glacier retreat, global warming, the glaciers are retreating. One village I know has moved about two miles down the hill towards the river. Another village right high up, Shun and Shade, they've moved 30 miles. And then that big village, Kausha, when I went there two years ago, I saw all these empty fields. I said, what's going on? They said, we've only planted, we're only able to plant 60% of our field because we haven't got enough irrigation water. Well, that's a disaster zone if you, if you're, um, you can't irrigate your own fields. So yes, there are some quite major problems and large populations in summer in Padum, a lot of infrastructure, but in winter, it'll be back down to, the, back down to basics, as they say. I'm going to um, finish with one last question. This is from Tanya Bruce Lockhart. And um, how much did the journey change you in person in terms of values and spirituality? And how have you applied this to the life that you are now living in the West Country? No, not a small question. Um, <laughs> I'm from the West Country. I grew up on the edge of Dartmoor, so I was quite used to being free range. Um, I was always interested in archaeology. So in a sense, I was, what I was doing was living archaeology in the sense I was, wasn't waiting for people to sort of you know, wait 2,000 years, then scratch around and try and find out what they're doing. It was actually living amongst people. That was fantastic. The agricultural bit was vital. And then I realized that to understand them properly, I would have to um, really not just study agriculture. You can do that anywhere, even in Ancestor, I believe, um, but actually get on with it. And um, I'm very much a hands-on sort of person. So I spent 20 years in Dorset and Somerset being a shepherd, sheep shearer, and even cider maker. So... I was living almost a Ladakhi Sanskari lifestyle here and um, yes it changed me and I'm curious enough I'm still in touch with one of the army officers and um, he's now a major general but he looked at me and he said get your hair cut. <laughs> well I, I think I think on that note um, something I had to do to myself earlier um, I'd like to firstly thank um, James for this wonderful uh, I mean very quick run through a very profound uh, poetic book that has really everything, adventure, practicality, um, bawdiness, spirituality, um, many lessons all rolled into one. Um, and I very much commend his book, Frozen River. Please try to um, purchase it from our local independent bookseller, Archway Bookshop. If you Google them, uh, you'll be able to order it from them. They're doing deliveries and you can also order signed copies if you contact Simon, the bookseller. And thank you to uh, them for our support. Uh, thank you to everyone who has been listening in this evening. There have been a lot of really wonderful questions. My apologies, I couldn't get to quite all of them. There's, there's a lot more that we could talk about with James's book and, and this region. The next um, 
Shoot Festival event will be on Thursday the 25th of June at 6 p.m. and we're going to have the Sunday Times Chief Foreign Correspondent Christina Lamb who's going to be talking about a very important um, and powerful new book, Our Bodies, Their Battlefield, about um, the impact of war on women and she will be speaking very much from her own experience as a war correspondent and foreign correspondent. She's going to be in a conversation with the co-director of the festival, Samantha Knight. So please do keep an eye out for that and register for that. But um, again, thank you to everyone for joining and also to members of the audience who have been sending in messages of um, greeting and thanks. Um, it's very welcome. And again, if you are able to um, make donations to help keep Shoot Festival uh, going and keep it free to everyone, then that will be very welcome. Please do visit our website to find out more about that. So now it's turned seven o'clock on the hour. Thank you again to James. Thank you to our audience and everyone. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Shoot Festival event on Thursday, June the 25th at 6 p.m. Christina Lamb. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.